welcome those who are arriving. Please do, as the uh, text says on the screen, uh, introduce yourself with your name and organisation in the chat box. We're going to give people a little bit more time to uh, arrive, maybe one more minute, and then uh, we will remove the screen and say hello to um, all of the speakers today. If you've got any questions, um, there's a Q&A tool, please pop something in there, otherwise we'll be with you shortly. Okay, I think we're going to get started. I'm going to take the uh, presentation off and go back to being able to see all of our lovely speakers today. So hopefully everybody can see us and people have um, introduced themselves in the chat box. Um, we are going to get started. So I'm going to go back and put um, my presentation up for everybody. Hold on one sec. I think it stopped working. One second. Okay. There we go. So for those still just joining us now, please do uh, pop your name in the chat box, say hello, we'd love to know who's here, what organisation you're from, and what your names are. So welcome everybody. As uh, many of you know, um, obviously the creative industries and technology um, sector facing a number of really extraordinary changes and challenges right now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today we'll be hearing from fundraising experts on a range of different income streams. My name is Lucy Stone. I run a consultancy called No Stone Unturned Fundraising, and I'll be chairing today. My main area of expertise is trust and foundation fundraising, but I do support a number of organizations who are diversifying from a reliance on that source of income into other areas of fundraising. I'm facilitating today on behalf of Always Possible, uh, always possible we help leaders work out what's next always possible support society's transformation through research events and radical collaboration and we help businesses through mentoring planning support guidance and support around inclusive growth and decision making today is a webinar um, is part of a series that actually um, of events and things that will be coming up to help fast track recovery in the creative industries and third sectors Today is brought to you as part of Essex 2020, which for those who don't know is a year of science and creativity. Essex 2020 offers a unique opportunity um, for people to engage in activities through science, technology, engineering, arts and maths. And it's here to celebrate Essex's pioneering past and create a sense of identity and pride that can drive future prosperity. So little bit of housekeeping. Um, not your normal where are the toilets, no fire alarm type thing, um, just a bit of housekeeping for the presentation today. So as I said, if you've got any qu uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will go through them at the end of the um, presentations. If you want to tweet, please do use all at always underscore possible um, and hashtag creative recovery, hashtag post traumatic growth. Um, and somebody will be monitoring that and can keep the conversation going, can bring questions in here and pass questions out through tw Twitter. So if there's something else you want to learn on this topic or something else in general that you want to learn, please do send a personal message on the chat function. You can send that to Vicky who is hosting today. And also just to let you know, the presentations will be sent out afterwards. So don't worry about noting down everything that's on the slides you will get all of these after today's um, session so we've got four fantastic speakers today um, each of them looking at different areas of fundraising they'll all speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll be doing a q a at the end of that i believe that we will be having a poll um, and I think Vicky is going to just pop that up for us. 
Is that okay, Vicky, to pop the poll up? I'm not sure if the panelists can see. Ah, oh, there you go. There's your poll. I'm not allowed to answer the poll because I'm a panelist. Um, so please just a uh, quick answer that poll. Thank you. So we're going to start with uh, Joe today. Joe is a creative arts and events specialist, consultant and lecturer. She's worked across a number of different industries, but her main focus has been arts, cultural and community sectors. Today, she's going to be looking at reframing your work and fundraising. So when you're thinking about what your fundraising needs are, you need to be really clear about your plan. Joe is going to encourage us to innovate and reframe and start to think about creating work in the new normal. Thank you, Joe. Oh, there we go. So I've un unmuted myself. Thanks so much, Lucy. I'll just uh, share my screen and get my slides up for you all. So I'm just going to disappear for a second and we'll do that. Oh. Lucy, can you tell me, can you see the screen okay? Yes, looks great. Joe. Great, perfect. Okay, I'll get started. Thanks so much. Okay, everyone. So thank you, Lucy, for the lovely introduction. So much of my work in arts is about developing creative strategies and programmes with charitable aims and outcomes, most of which uh, require funding from grants and trusts in order to support the project costs. So today I wanted to talk about reframing our creative work in the light of COVID-19 pandemic and within that building a case for funding. I'm going to talk a bit about the festival that I work for, specifically Southwest Fest as a case study and then talk about how we've approached this ourselves and what we're learning in the process of reframing our work. So a little bit of background about the festival. Southwest Fest is a cultural community festival which takes place in South Westminster. Uh, we're a charity that was set up in 2008, but the festival in fact was first produced by the community in 2004. So uh, we've been running physical events in the area for about 16 years. Uh, we, it, uh, the aims of the festival, the charitable aims, are to produce opportunities which encourage community cohesion, to support neighbourhood renewal by tackling social exclusion and promoting local services, and generating partnerships and collaborations between local community groups, people and organisations. So we achieve this work by working in collaboration with partners, artists and practitioners to plan events, workshops and activities which change every year and engage and inspire residents to come out and take part. Each year the programme usually takes place over three weeks in July, which includes our outdoor festival day, which is our sort of um, key showpiece of the, the festival, which attracts a footfall of around 7,000 local people. Uh, last year, our festival theme was space, uh, and this included a crossover of cultural science, technology, engineering, arts and math activities and events. Uh, all the events we produce um, in-house are produced for free for people to attend. So we have an open access program where our partners put on events and we also run our in-house program. And um, we have to fundraise to support the costs of these events because we don't make an income through ticket sales. So our fundraising includes funding from grants, income from sponsorships, crowdfunding, and a small income from stores and advertising opportunities. However, as you can imagine, with the onset of the coronavirus in February and March this year, we had to make a very difficult decision uh, to cancel this year's festival. We also face uh, huge financial issues uh, due to loss of finances through deposits already paid out that were unretrievable, and through having to cancel freelance staff and contracts. And we also had to think about what to do with specific project funding, which was ring fence for projects for this year. So from March and April, we've been mainly researching, getting advice and firefighting our current situation. So after making the hard decision to cancel the event, and once we were done with the worst of firefighting, our next question was what now? So we met with our trustees and started looking at our options. We strongly felt that we didn't want to just sit around and do nothing. We know from the feedback from our partners and from our audiences that the festival is a key event in the, in the year, it's looked forward to every year, and that for our organisations we work with, it offers a really main opportunity for collaboration, wider outreach into the community, and that for our communities, um, they are better supported because of the festival, because they come and learn about these great organisations and services that are available to them. So we looked at various options, including producing a small event in the winter, 
but actually with no guarantees on how long the pandemic will affect us for and affect public gatherings, we really felt like planning any kind of return to physical events at this time was very risky. So then we started to look about options of online delivery. But as you can imagine, many of our partner services have also started to go online and deliver services online as well. And we want to be aware of the potential that we don't want to end up replicating services and activities already on offer. We also wanted to know more about the demographics of residents who are taking up these online services, because part of our own work is to try and reach more isolated people in the community and make our events inclusive and accessible. And we were worried that by producing just online might make some of our events inaccessible to our community. We also decided to speak to our partners and get research done and review other information being provided by our local council and other key sources. And this was to try and better understand the current gaps in services after the pandemic or during the pandemic and the current needs uh, of our local residents. So in the process of questioning, what do we do now? It was key to us, whatever we look to do through reframing our work, we make sure that our main charitable aims are still met and that our community was still supported. We also had to consider what resources, resources we had from diverting from our physical event production and the limitation of time and capacity with working with a reduced workforce. Further to that, we were also aware of um, anything that we choose to do now would be new and different from our usual work. We've got over 15 years experience producing physical festival and proof of positive outcomes of that event. However, by directing ourselves in a new and different delivery, we're heading into unknown territory. And it was important uh, to acknowledge and recognize that this work would be a testing and pilot and sort of development stage for our charity. Finally, there was also recognition that we wanted to use the time, this is a time of change, an opportunity to evolve and innovate and change the ways that we work and what we do. So key feedback from our partners in the research process was that actually there was a good diverse range of community accessing online content, including more isolated members of the community. However, our partners also fed up back that although activities were going online, they still felt that further promotion and engagement was needed. So from this and our wider research, we decided to reframe our work from 20 to, for 2020 in the following ways. So we decided we could start simple, straight off. An easy thing for us to do would be able to just dedicate more time to using our social media and online platforms for signposting of other activities, organizations and services, highlighting and promoting the important work that was taking place locally with our partners. We then would work within our capacity to deliver a new service. And for this, we needed to develop a fundraising bid to support a smaller, more affordable week-long digital festival, which still offers some of the same aims and outcomes as our physical festival, but uh, was delivered online, going for quality over quantity of content, uh, in which we looked to commission and curate online workshops, events and activities, uh, special events which act as a hook to draw people's interest and attention to the festival programme to promote an open, online ac open access online uh, program of partner events and activities, which again serve to help highlight the activities and opportunities by our partners, organizations, local groups and people that are taking place in the area. And lastly, to make sure we collaborate with partners to create crossover projects, widen engagement as well as supporting match uh, and in-kind funding for the project. And finally, looking at how we can redirect our, our resources make the most time most of the time we've created uh, through not working on large-scale physical productions of events so instead we've used this additional time which is freed up this year to work on an impact research project to help us quantify the longer term legacy and impact the festivals made in the past and to help us to continue to develop programs which reflect the interest in current sort of pandemic and post-pandemic needs of our community in the future this will hopefully put us in a stronger position for future fundraising, as well as getting buy-in from new sponsors and corporate partners. So from the research and measured work we've done, we built a case. We had then applied to our local grant giving organization specifically for funding towards our digital festival, uh, which I can say, thankfully the bid was successful. And we are actually currently in the process of um, planning and producing the festival itself. We were also at the same time, we approached our partners for match funding through collaboration on some of the digital festival events, getting buy-in and making our case stronger with them involved as well. And then we also committed some of our own reserves to supporting the project, which would then enable the festival and the charity to move forward in a new form of 
delivery so we can continue to support our community and organisations in Westminster through 2020. We've also put in bed, bids to support our research project, uh, which we're still waiting for the outcome for, in which we'll also be using the research project and the digital festival as part of our research and our data collection. So in summary, don't be scared to reframe what you do. Now is the time to see this as a positive opportunity for your organisation. Uh, make sure you research, research current needs and gaps. Um, obviously, this is changing all the time in the current climate, but try and stay as current as you can and up to date. Don't be scared to innovate, explore and discover. We've never done an online event before at Southwest Fest, which I'm actually really ashamed to say, we've always just done physical events. So now is a really big time of innovation for us and our work, and hopefully we can learn from it and continue to do maybe blending of physical and online events in the future. Um, test pilot and test and pilot your work. If you haven't done something before, it's okay to start small and, and simple in order to build big. Find partners and collaborate. We're always stronger together. And uh, I know that most funders like to see collaboration and partnership in, in funding bids. Um, use what you've learned along the way to build a stronger case of funding. So use these steps and these methods in order to build a stronger case. And finally, um, just three points to take away, which is to start simple. Um, don't be scared to test and innovate and to admit and acknowledge that you're at a development and testing stage and then use that to reframe your work and start creating the new normal. Okay, right, stop sharing that and I will pop my face back online here. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. If you've got, if people have got any questions, please do pop them in the Q and A box. And just for those who've arrived a bit later um, than when we started, do introduce yourselves. My chat box is over there, but maybe yours is over there. Uh, introduce yourself in the chat box. Say hello, where you're from, and what your name is. Um, that would be really fantastic. And also, um, for those who joined uh, a bit late, all of the presentations will be sent out to you. So don't worry about photographing the screen or whatever. You will get all of those slides. And also, the whole thing is being um, put out live onto Facebook. So if there's any little bits that you miss, you can always go back and have another look at it there. So next up is Martha, who's a fundraising consultant specializing in corporate um, partnerships and is an organizer of hashtag charity so white, which you all need to go and look at, not now, but straight after the session. Um, Martha has previously supported Refuge, West London Mission and Ronald McDonald House Charities, as well as others in uh, various different face-to-face -face roles. With corporate fundraising, I think a lot of people assume that none of that is happening right now. Martha is going to really challenge that assumption and give you some really practical ways to think about moving forward. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, Lucy. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Martha. I am a fundraising consultant. And as Lucy said, I am now the treasurer of Charity So White. Um, we've, a lot's been going on in the last couple of weeks, but yeah, I think it would be really um, good for everybody to follow our Twitter. Um, and I've just taken on a role as head of fundraising at Money for, for Youth. Um, so I'd say that employee engagement is my real skill um, in corporate partnerships, but I've also kind of done trust and foundations events and individual giving too. Um, so I've got a really varied experience, um, but yes, corporate partnerships is my main love and I'm here to tell you why you should be going out and making those asks. So I don't have a presentation, I'm very sorry. Um, so <laughs> I'll try and uh, be clear and slow so you can um, capture what I'm saying. Um, so I've got um, three main, main points um, about you know, how you can make the most of corporate partnerships um, during the pandemic. And they are um, harnessing the power of honesty and vulnerability, embracing digital, and being an opportunist. So let's look at the power of honesty and vulnerability. Um, this is a really uncertain time for us all, right? Um, especially us in the charity sector and especially people in the cultural sector, but it's a challenging time for businesses too. Um, everybody's got the same concerns. What's coming next? How can we ensure that our organization survives. So when the pandemic first hit, um, I made sure that when I was talking to my partners and my key contacts, um, I was just talking to them as human beings, you know, 
we all know that if a charity and a business are talking, then it's <laughs> about fundraising. It's about some kind of ask. So you don't really, in those first conversations when the pandemic hit, I wasn't making any asks. I was just talking to my contacts, asking them how their families were, um, telling them about, you know, me struggling because I'm living alone. Um, and, you know, that kind of, that kind of human element um, really made, made a difference. It made, it made a difference in strengthening the relationships that I had with my existing partners and um, building a kind of a more long lasting and more personal relationships with prospects in a way that I'd never really done before. Um, I think people think of corporate partnerships as quite salesy, um, the side of fundraising that's got a bit less of a heart, but actually everyone in your business is a human being. Um, and you know, we're all going through this human crisis at the moment. Um, so, you know, there was an honesty about kind of and vulnerability about how we were all doing, but then also was making sure to be really honest about what the situation of uh, the charity that I was representing was. Um, you know, what would happen if we weren't able to carry on because um, we didn't get enough funding. Um, and yeah, just give, give, giving regular updates about kind of how the pandemic is affecting each of us, um, affecting our beneficiaries, um, affecting our income. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I'm just keeping it really, really personal. Um, but you shouldn't be afraid to be vulnerable like that. Um, you know, we're living in unprecedented times and everybody's going through something. Um, so avoid, like, avoiding that conversation is kind of pointless um, because people want to connect. Uh, people are bored, people are lonely, uh, people are grieving. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they want to feel heard and they want someone to have a conversation with them kind of on, 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 on a personal level. Um, so that's why that was my first point. But then also honesty with yourself and your teams is so important. Um, fundraisers are always working. <laughs> I'm sure every single, well, most of you over this weekend would have still worked too. Um, so, you know, we're always trying to find reasons to not take a break. And it is when you're in these kind of target driven roles um, and competing for income, it can feel like it's the right idea to not take a break or to not tell people that actually you need a few days of annual leave, uh, you're struggling. You know, in the last few weeks, um, there's been you know, it, the, the, everything that's been going on with the Black Lives Matter movement and George Floyd, I told my managers that I, I couldn't work at the same way that I was working before. Um, and that, you know, that, that really did make a difference. Um, burnout fundraisers are not effective fundraisers. So make sure that you're being really honest with yourself about how you're doing. Um, embracing digital is my next point. Um, so yeah, we were all working from home at the beginning of the crisis um, or furloughed at home. Um, and as I said before, people are always looking to connect. So digital engagement is, um, is, is, is a great opportunity at the moment. Um, so in my previous role, I was partnered with a makeup, a makeup uh, business. And their business model was that they had, you know, um, loads of reps across the country, not that many people in offices and the offices that they had were quite far away from where I was based in London. Um, and you know, one, one time I did an engagement event with them. I did kind of a round table talk. So I got the train all the way up to Northampton, um, from London, it took me two and a half hours, got there to do my event and seven people turned up. Um, and yeah, it, it wasn't great. Um, it was kind of a waste of money and a waste of time. Um, and I'd always really struggled with that business to, you know, get people to engage. Um, so when I had that really open discussion with them, um, when the crisis hit about actually what, what is it that you need from this partnership? They said that the reason that they can't engage us because I was working for a domestic violence charity and people don't want to talk about domestic violence because they don't know the right terminology. They feel awkward asking questions and then, you know, people saying, you know, that's inappropriate or, um, or yeah, not an intelligent question to be asking. Um, so we devised um, a digital kind of engagement event. Um, it was really simple. Um, it was, you know, a Zoom call. It was open to members of staff. They could submit their questions to me ahead of time so that, you know, anonymously so that they wouldn't feel awkward if they asked something that, um, that other people wouldn't ask. Um, and yeah, it was, it, it was an amazing event. Um, I invited one of our volunteers from the helpline um, to talk for five to 10 minutes. People were asking questions in the chat. Um, and as I said before, the last time I did that event, um, I had seven people arrive. This time when I did it online, there were 88 people on the call, including incredibly senior members of staff who I'd never been able to, you know, even get in front of before. 
Um, so now is a really, really, really good time for digital engagement. I would make the most of it before people start, you know, going back into their offices and their droves. Um, and in the same way, I find it a lot easier to get in touch with CEOs, um, directors, you know, the people that are the decision makers. You can now get in, have a meeting with them, you know, booked within a week. Um, sometimes it would take me months to get a CEO into a room. Uh, now I can do it, you know, in, in a matter of days. Um, so if you want to engage with a CEO, with a senior decision maker, now is the time because they are at home. They are sick of talking to their children <laughs> and they want, and they want, they want something interesting to do because life has become very work centric um, because you can't really go outside and engage with your friends in the same way that you would. I would also make the most of live streaming fundraising. You can use Tiltify, Facebook, Instagram to run live streaming events. Um, there's some good examples that Comic Relief have done where they have got their um, like fundraisers to put on um, dr yeah, dramatic readings of their favorite films. Um, and I think that's something that can work really well in the arts um, sector, the arts and culture sector. You can do live streams of music festivals. You can do a live stream of, yeah, a, a play. Um, and it's, it's a really great way to engage uh, staff members um, and to give them, yeah, I guess, I guess a feeling of being, a, yeah, I guess everybody's feeling a bit powerless at the moment. So kind of giving people the opportunity to really make a difference um, is really, really important. Um, if there is a digital workshop or a digital a digital event that you've always wanted to put on but have never actually kind of had the resources to do now is the time to ask a corporate partner to sponsor you or to ask a prospect to sponsor that workshop that you want to run online um you know tech tech organizations are making a lot of money at the moment um because we're all rely so heavily reliant on tech reach out to them um and see if they will um sponsor one of your programs that you haven't been able to get off the uh, off the ground yet and finally, uh, being an opportunist. Um, I'd say I'm definitely an opportunist. Um, and I think fundraising is all about opportunity. Um, so a lot of the things that I've mentioned um, in the last 10 minutes have been where I've seen opportunities um, during this crisis. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, each, each organization will have different, different um, opportunities for them. Um, but the most important thing is to speak to your partners, speak to your prospects, Ask them how a partnership with you can help them, you know, um, whether it's improving staff morale, which is really, really down at the moment, improving their, you know, PR opportunities for them. There are a lot of organizations who need to improve their PR. They need to stay relevant because there's not much that they can sell in terms of their services and their products. How can you, how can you keep that business relevant? How can, you know, they use your, use your brand name to get a good reputation and to kind of, build that momentum on the way out of lockdown because it's going to be very difficult uh, for businesses kind of moving into moving back into um, starting work. Morale is going to be really, really low. You want to be part of that solution for them. So how can you make yourself part of that solution? Um, you know, and what, what can businesses do to amplify your reach as well? Um, I had a cinema chain um, that was one of my partners who, you know, when the crisis hit, they were completely irrelevant. So they needed us more than, than ever before. So all of their content was about that, you know, was about working with refuge and amplifying things through, through that. Um, so there's definitely a lot of opportunity. And also your, if you have partners already and they have furloughed staff, how can those, fur, those furloughed staff members um, be, yeah, kind of become, become an army, I guess, of support for your organization. Can they, you know, take on a project management opportunity of just doing a bunch of fundraising um, because people who are furloughed are bored <laughs> and again, want to engage, want to feel like they're part of the solution to what is, you know, one of the, one of the biggest crises that has, that has faced us nationally. Um, so yeah, just have a look at all of the opportunities, map it out, um, and see what you can do next because yeah, corporate fundraising is definitely not over. Um, and if you're smart about it, then in, you know, in the lead up to kind of coming out of lockdown, you can have some really strong and well-established relationships that as soon as it's kind of business as usual, um, they're going to be massive supporters for you. And they'll remember that you helped them coming out of lockdown. Um, yeah, that, that's it for me, I think. So to sum up, the power of honesty and vulnerability, embracing digital and being an opportunist is what's going to get you
to have strong corporate relationships in a time when it feels impossible. Thanks. Thank you so much, Martha. That was really fantastic. I can see a few questions coming into the uh, Q&A box, which we'll do all the Q&A bit at the end after everyone's uh, talk. So if you've got any more questions, um, pop them in the Q&A. Not sure to do that in the chat, that's fine. I can see some people have done that as well. Um, so next we will be handing over to Will. Will is a funding man manager at Esme Fairburn Foundation, but he's actually wearing his freelance management consultant kind of uh, not-for-profit creative sector support hat today. He's also a board member of Attitude and is Everything and has previously worked with a number of different trust and foundations, including Help Musicians UK, Youth Music, London Community Foundation, Armed Forces Covenant Fund and the Health Lottery. So today Will is focusing on trust and foundations and he's going to show us how funders have responded to the crisis, but also get you to start thinking about how you can evolve your approach for now, but also what you need to be doing to get yourself kind of ready and thinking for the post-COVID world. So handing over to Will now. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Lucy, yeah, for the introduction um, and for inviting me to speak. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, as Lucy said, I'm um, kind of wearing a different hat today. I am a grants manager at Esme Fairbank Foundation, one of the um, largest grant funders uh, in the UK, but I'm not representing them today. I'm just uh, kind of drawing on my knowledge of the sector more generally and uh, of all the, the places that um, all the funders that I've worked at. Um, so I thought I'd just start with a little quick general overview of the um, trust and foundation sector just to just to set the scene a little bit and give a bit of context. Um, so kind of grant giving in this country is worth 6.5 billion per year um, of which 2.9 billion is from the top 300 foundations um, and that doesn't even include Arts Council, the lottery or any public money that's all um, private, family and corporate trust and foundations. Um, so you, you can see the kind of, you know, huge um, size of the sector. There's actually 10,000 uh, trust and foundations in total in the country uh, of all sizes. Many of them are small and, and local. Um, all those trust and foundations collectively hold about 67 billion in assets and investments. And that drives the grant givings because usually the model is that um, any gains in investments is then given away um, as grants every year. Um, the Wellcome Trust is by far the biggest uh, trust. Um, it does skew the figures somewhat. Uh, other big ones, Comic Relief, BBC Children in Need, Garfield Western, and quite a lot that are focused on the arts. So there's no problem being one of them. Paul Hamlin Foundation, the Foyle Foundation, Claude Duffield and Bering Foundation spring to mind. Uh, anyone who wants to kind of delve into that a little deeper, there's a great report called the Foundations Giving Trends Report um, on the ACF, Association for Charitable Foundations website, um, and it has loads more information on data on, um, on that if you're interested in uh, looking that up. Uh, also, just to say, I didn't put it on the slide, but um, a different, another statistic, which isn't quite as positive, is that um, trust and foundations boards are 99% white, two thirds male, and 60% over the age of 65. That was as of 2018. So there's clearly some work to be done there on diverse boards. Um, but I thought that was a little interesting statistic there. So just to kind of go over a little bit of, about how trust and foundations have responded to the emergency uh, to COVID-19 so far, and then I'll move on to, to kind of moving forwards. Um, so obviously the initial response was an emergency response. So uh, lots of funders closed to kind of normal applications um, and launched emergency funds. So uh, Esme Fairbairn launched a £16 million fund and Paul Hamlin a £20 million fund. That's on top of their normal annual grant giving budgets. Uh, obviously, we've got the Arts Council emergency fund as well that, um, that launched as well. So that was the kind of initial response was um, to kind of um, step up and, and help organisations in immediate need. Uh, Lots of grant makers have been flexible in their approach in repurposing grants, so perhaps unrestricting existing grants and being much more flexible on approach to help those uh, in needs. So, you know, to kind of lessen the um, administrative burden. And then something that's very interesting uh, is the COVID-19 grants tracker. So this is run by 
uh, an organisation called 360 Giving. It's a free online resource uh, that tracks UK grant making and makes that data available to fundraisers, to charities, the public, and to grant makers themselves. Uh, and they've launched a COVID-19 grants tracker. And that shows kind of grant making in relation to COVID-19 almost in real time. So it's got live data, um, just to give a kind of local example. So Essex Community Foundation is on there and you can see they've made 148 grants uh, totaling 1.25 million. Uh, that's only over the last couple of months, just in response to COVID-19. It's a good resource because you can delve into the data and you can see uh, what kind of grants trusts and foundations are making right now in response to the emergency, whether it's kind of um, immediate need or kind of regular work or a combination of the both. Uh, and you can see where they are and how much. So I uh, urge you to go and look at that. There's also been a lot of funder collaborations and, and pooled funds. So uh, for example, uh, London funders have uh, run one with about 50 funders signed up where they pool their funds and put them towards specific causes, uh, which you know uh, helps with duplication of effort. Um, so there's lots more in development. Uh, so look out for, for collaborations. Uh, and just a little note on investments. Obviously, I said that there's 67 billion held in, in assets by trusts and foundations. Obviously, with the financial impact um, of the emergency, the investments have taken a hit. Uh, a challenge there may be that there'll be lower grant making in the future as, as we wait for those things to, uh, to the investments to recover. Um, but obviously, you know, much like pensions, investments are long term, um, so it will recover to, to, to normal levels eventually. Uh, now, what changes trust and donations have made? So, um, firstly, just a note on the COVID-19 funders pledge. So, 350 of the biggest funders have signed up uh, to a pledge to commit to a certain approach now going forward to how they're going to handle applications, how they're going to assess them and how they're going to manage grants. So, there's information there on covid19funders.org.uk if you want to have a look at that. As I said, lots of um, funders closed or, or moved to emergency only funding. So, uh, that's Arts Council. Uh, Esme Fairman have closed till the autumn. Uh, Paul Hamlin and Wolfson Foundation have closed. Um, but there are many, I think someone put a question in the chat about this, there are many who are still open um, and, and accepting kind of normal um, applications. So National Treasury has um, a £200 million emergency fund for small, medium charities and social enterprises, uh, but it is also open for regular funding as well. Uh, Garfield Western is open for crisis funding and regular funding. Royal Foundation has just recently opened for small grants and then you've got John Elliman for Trust have launched a specific program for small charities and social enterprises and that's unrestricted funding and Henry Smith uh, charity as well and for individuals there's a number of um, sources help musicians who came being one of them uh, for individual musicians not eligible for government support and then finally uh, just thinking about kind of expectations um, and kind of applications going forward um, so just give a couple of examples here of what I think foundations will be looking for in the kind of short to medium term. So I think remain kind of agile and adaptable to changing or narrowing criteria. So as funders reopen again over the coming months, they may have different criteria. So make sure you check that and, and you know, ensure that you've done some work to kind of realign things um, and, and make yourself adaptable. Uh, I think applications that will shine through will also be uh, from organisations not treating this as a, as a one-off emergency and just making temporary adjustments, but ones that are thinking longer term, thinking how things will be different so you can show that you're being strategic um, and not just reactive. And I think trusts will be looking for innovation and creative responses to COVID-19. So whether that's through the arts or creativity or technology, um, really kind of almost using it to your advantage to see um, how you can help with a creative or innovative response. So uh, just to give two examples recently, I've seen um, at Esme, we had a, an arts organization in Gloucestershire uh, that applied successfully for a grant towards um, a creative and co-produced response to the psychological impacts of COVID-19 that's gonna scale existing arts on prescription services um, by adding a home delivery and a digital offer. So they're really quick to, to respond to that. Uh, and another example is a theatre, a small theatre in Manchester, uh, which applied for a grant for a collaborative scheme in response to COVID-19, which supports uh, artists in the Northwest with online development opportunities. Um, 
And I think, yeah, using whatever you do to respond to emerging issues, obviously, COVID-19 is going to lead to lots of long lasting issues, mental health crisis, unemployment. So using whatever you do, whether it's arts or technology as a vehicle to help with those emerging issues. And of course, um, digital and online are playing a bigger part now. And I think that will continue going forward. And I think lots of trusts will be making extra money available for digital uh, and data related projects. Um, yep. Yeah. That's it for me. So any questions, I'll respond once um, all the speakers have spoken. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Will. As Will said, we're going to do Q&A at the end. So keep popping your question in that Q&A box. Again, on mine, it's at the bottom. Um, so our final speaker um, before we go to the Q&A is David, who's an incredibly experienced fundraiser. He mainly works in the arts and cultural sector, um, but works across all different types of fundraising through his consultancy, Apollo Fundraising. Previous to setting that up, he was working with the Royal Exchange Theatre, Glyndebourne and English Touring Opera. So I don't know about you, but I'm certainly giving it a lot more to charities and crowdfunders since we've gone into lockdown. David's going to explore how individual giving in the arts can be done and what you need to be focusing on. So handing over to David now, thank you. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, hi everybody, I hope everyone's keeping well. Uh, as Lucy mentioned, I'm a fundraising consultant. I run a company called Apollo Fundraising and we specialize in supporting arts and culture organizations. Uh, and just looking at the uh, people joining us today, there's a lot of museums that I recognize. I do a lot of work with Share Museums East, um, big organizations across Essex, so it's great to be here today. Uh, before I get into the how uh, of, of fundraising for individuals, I just want to start by posing the following question, and actually it'd be great to get your thoughts on this as well in the, um, in the chat box as to whether you think actually we can fundraise uh, from individuals at this time. Can you, uh, just while I bring the slides up, can you just uh, write yes, no, or not sure as to whether you think it's appropriate for arts and culture organisations to be fundraising from individuals during a, a global health pandemic? Excellent, I'm loving this. Lots of yeses. Oh, okay. Well, one, one depends what you're asking for. Uh, so good news is I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I think not only can we, I think we absolutely should be. But I know a lot of organisations have been nervous about being seen to be fundraising during this time. Um, so some of the sort of most common reasons I've seen given for why people don't feel it's appropriate at this time. People saying, well, it could appear insensitive. So lots of people have sadly died as a result of this. Most people by now know someone who's lost their life to COVID or um, sort of through degrees of separation. There's an argument that people have been financially impacted by what's been going on. People who've either seen their income drop through being made redundant or being put on furlough, um, changes in, in stock shares, whatever it might be. Um, one that's come up a huge amount of times. There are um, far more needy courses than the arts and culture sector at the moment. You know, why should we be asking people to support this nice to have thing that is arts and culture when we need that money on the front line and, and tackling, this, tackling this disease? Uh, this one I had uh, part way through last week. It looks like we're jumping on the coronavirus bandwagon. Not quite sure what that means. Uh, and another one, well, what about, about our brand? This makes us look really, really needy, really desperate to be seen to be to be asking for money. I'm going to drill into a couple of these as we go through, but I just want to show the other side of this. Um, so throughout uh, lockdown, I've been interviewing arts fundraisers who have been continuing to fundraise and particularly fundraising from individuals to share their stories. Uh, so two of the organisations I've, I've spoken to recently, so the Young Classical Artists Trust, who do a lot to support uh, musicians at an early stage in their careers. So really talented people just sort of breaking through uh, to, to start their professional career. They realised as soon as the world went into lockdown, all of the young artists that they look after were, were going to see their income just disappear like that. 
So they set up uh, a hardship fund. So they put some of their own reserves into this, but they also went out um, with an initial fundraising target of £5,000, smashed through that in 48 hours. And after three weeks, they'd raised £100,000. And this is a, a, a pretty small charity. £100,000 is equivalent to about their, their annual fundraising target. And yet they did that in, in three weeks. Some of you might be familiar with the Park Theatre. Uh, based in London. They're quite a new theatre, they've been around for about seven years, but again found themselves looking at saying even with furlough we're going to really struggle here, we're going to struggle to keep the theatre going. Um, so got on the phones and launched what they called their Park Life campaign. And the first part of it saw them uh, speaking to their existing major donors, their existing supporters, it was their artistic director, um, their development director and some of the, uh, the other artists, the actors that were associated with the company getting on the phone and asking for support. And again, £300,000 raised just in that first week. And again, uh, they normally raise between £300,000 and £350,000 a year through fundraising. Just two examples um, through the podcast I've been doing, there are a lot more, and I'm sure there are a hundred more examples like that out there. And some people mentioning in the, in the chat uh, that they've been continuing to fundraise. So I'd love to hear how you've been getting on as well. But I would argue that the fact that these organizations are seeing such fantastic results dispels some of these myths that other organizations are using um, as a reason to, to hold back from fundraising at this time. And I would say if people thought this was insensitive or if people thought there were other more needy causes, they wouldn't be giving. The, this is absolutely a, a case where the results help to dispel this. I'd also say if you're coming up with the argument at this point that there are other more needy causes at the moment, you're going to find there is never a right time to be fundraising because there's always going to be something else going on in the world that you look at and say, gosh, how, how, can, how can we compete with that? And I flip it on its head and say our supporters are much more complex than that. You know, taking this idea that one cause outranks the other is so simplistic. Our supporters are capable of caring about multiple things. They can be campaigning and, and protesting at the moment for Black Lives Matter and making donations to causes working in that space and making donations to organizations on the front line of coronavirus and supporting the, the arts and culture organizations they care most about during this time, all, all on the same day. They're capable of caring about these different things at different times. And part of the reason that this is important is, is I think we need to remember what, what fundraising is actually about. And when we distill it and when we sort of really boil it right down, our job as fundraisers is about trying to find people who need or want to change something about their world and find a way that we can empower them to make that, that change. And the financial support they give is just the way of powering that, that change. But getting into that mindset of saying, well, what do our what, what do our supporters need and want at this point? And I want to come back to something that Martha mentioned um, during her talk just now. Um, mentioned feeling, feeling bored and lonely. And I just want you to, to raise your hands if any of these things have been true over the last couple of weeks when we've been in lockdown. Um, so raise your hands if at any point you have felt bored. Raise your hands if you felt uh, lonely and, and separated from friends and family. So hands go, I can see, see some the speaker's hands. Um, put your hand up if, if you felt powerless during this, or that sort of sense of that loss of, of control at this time. Uh, hands up if you felt disconnected from the, the communities that you really identify, that you feel are a really important part of your self-identity. Hands up who started to just now imagine what they want the world to look like when we start coming out the other side of, of lockdown. Yeah, so, so I can see, see most of the speakers there putting their hands up and I'm sure the, for the people joining us that I can't see as well, there'll have been at least one or two things there that, that really resonate with you. And that's absolutely true for the people we're asking to make donations as well. That's true for our supporters. There is this sort of level playing field in that we are experiencing even at that sort of base level, the same, the same things, even if the level of impact that coronavirus has had is, is impacting us in different ways. And the great news for us is that fundraisers can provide the cure to these, um, these emotions, these, these feelings. By doing our job, 
we can help negate some of these negative emotions that, that people are experiencing as a result of the coronavirus lockdown. And that's both through asking people to make donations and support our work, as well as the, the wider part of fundraising of building relationships of um, maintaining those relationships with our supporters as acting as that sort of double agent between the organizations we work for and the supporters we're looking after. So I just want to go through uh, three ways that again, based on the interviews and, and stories that I've been hearing, uh, three ways I think you can engage with individual supporters at this time that help them to meet some of these needs while also raising money for your organizations. So the first thing I, I urge you to do is reach out to your supporters, people who've already given you money, people who are already part of your, your network, and, and just find out how they are. Yeah. There's something incredibly powerful about, about reaching out and saying, just, just want to check that you're okay. I want, we can talk about fundraising, we can talk about the organization, but let's just, just check how, how you are. And it, it helps people to see that you don't just view them as a bank account or a cash cow or you, know, you, you don't only contact them when you want something. And we have all been in relationships and friendships like that where we only ever hear from someone when they need something. Uh, and they're not friendships or relationships that we want to be in. Pick up the phone. The, uh, the phone is a fantastic um, channel for us at the moment. Organisations uh, using phone as part of their fundraising mix at this, this time are seeing far greater results. It's not a channel we tend to use in arts and culture fundraising very often. But absolutely, this is the time because people are at home or people are contactable more often and people are looking for new people to talk to. As Martha said, we're fed up of talking to our children. We're fed up of games nights uh, with our families. We're looking for someone outside of that immediate bubble. To check they're okay, ask if, ask if there's any way that your organization can help them. This might also be a chance to connect supporters to, to other people with a shared interest. So again, that sense that we're looking for those communities that that share an interest or that we like to feel part of. So some organizations have been using Zoom to do uh, virtual drinks receptions or, um, or supporter events. Uh, and they've been able to pair supporters up, people on other sides of the planet who you'd never normally get in the same room. They're able to, to link up via, via Zoom and, and sort of forge these connections, which has been really nice. Give them an update on your work and particularly now as organizations are starting to think about reopening um, particularly i guess for the, for the museums or the, the visitor attractions uh, within the group today you're starting to think well how might we be able to open the doors and your supporters are going to be really interested to hear how those plans are progressing but also say use this as a chance to find out what your supporters want to see going forward both for your organization but also the wider world and this can be a great chance to find out what motivates your supporters. So take the time, given that we've got this chance to redefine what normal looks like, if you ruled the world, what, how would you design it? What, what would you put in place? Uh, and as I say, use it to find out a bit more about what motivates them, why they support your organization and what they're feeling passionately about at this time. One example of this, and this has been uh, shared quite a lot, uh, was RNLI, who jumped on this uh, really early on in lockdown. Uh, and as soon as you see the sort of subject line of this, a special message from one crew member to another, I was like, oh, this is interesting, click on this. And straight away, um, it's just such a, it's so different from what we expect charity communications to, to sound like, to, to feel like. And the fact that they've taken the time to say, we just want to hear how, how you are, we just want to check that you're okay. And this is accompanied with, um, with a really powerful video that, that reiterates that point. And they've got a huge amount of love, both from their supporters and new people from outside looking at this saying, that's a really nice way of making people feel part of that, that family at this time. Second tip is to ask for help if you need it. Um, so there's absolutely nothing saying you've got to run a fundraising campaign or fundraising appeal during coronavirus, but, most organizations are looking at this saying we're, we're going to face some level of challenge because of being shut down for so long or as a, as a result of coronavirus. Um, you might have seen Chester Zoo over the last few days launching their appeal to save the zoo because they've been closed for so long. Um, they don't have money to, to feed the animals and to support their conservation work. So if there is a need, if there are things that you're not able to do, you've absolutely got something to base an appeal on. 
the flip side of this is um, there was a, a private school uh, or a, um, a music school associated with that who, who just out of nowhere said, right, this, that's it, we're going to have to close. And their Facebook page is full of people saying, if we had known that you needed our help, we would absolutely have been there for you. So if there is something you need people's help with, don't be afraid to go out to those closest to you and ask for support. And one example, if you're looking at it saying, actually, there's still quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, Park Theatre, who, who I mentioned just now, they had no idea when they started their campaign when they'd be able to, to reopen. So they, at first they thought, well, that's quite a lot of uncertainty there. But they worked out that when they got the green light from government, it was going to cost them about £100,000 to be able to get a show up and running and on stage to then be able to bring people back in. So they knew how much money they'd need, even if they didn't know when they'd be able to spend it. So they based the campaign on building up that war chest and making sure they had that money ready to go. So that the moment they got the green light, they could, uh, they could start rehearsals, they could start putting things on stage to give them the best chance of getting the doors open as quickly as possible. So even if you're not sure of all of the details, just trying to work out actually what what are the things that we do know and is there enough there to go out with a compelling message to supporters and say here's how you can make a difference here's how you can make this possible so be clear about the problem you're facing um, and particularly looking at what is at risk you know, what, what is the thing that might not happen if you're not able to raise the money what do you lose if that money's not there and link it back to why your your audience should care and i'd say at the moment you're particularly looking at those people closest to you so people who've supported or who at least have some connection to what you do. Um, this is not such a great time for doing sort of wider acquisition, although some organisations, again, have still been able to, to do that if they've been able to build up enough presence. Just as for example, will be getting lots of donations from people they have no connection to. But on the whole, it's going to be those who, who care most about your work. So be clear about what you're asking them to do and then make it as easy as possible for people to give. Uh, and that probably means looking at uh, making sure people can make donations through digital channels, bearing in mind people are still not feeling as comfortable to go out, go to the post office, go to the post box. Um, and again, if people are not, not dealing in cash and a few people dealing with check at this time, again, making sure you can take those, those car payments over the phone or online. Um, but then coming back to this idea that we know that some people have been have been financially impacted, I think it is important to make sure it's, it is okay to say no and to, to at least address the fact that you understand some people have been have been affected by this. But obviously that's not true. That's not true for everybody. And the final tip, uh, and again it, it links to Martha's point earlier about uh, vulnerability and and, be, and being really honest. Uh, I go further and say. The organizations that are doing well are the ones that are being absolutely human in their messaging, uh, which is another way of saying, please, 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 can we get rid of this cold corporate crap that fills most arts and culture fundraising? This um, copy feels like it's been written by a fax machine or someone's asked Alexa to, to produce it for them. Humans, uh, people like to give to pe people. So making sure that our message feels like it's come from an identified human being, that it contains that emotion. Um, the Park Theatre's campaign absolutely worked because the artistic director could talk to someone on a one-to-one -one basis and say, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm really scared about what this is going to mean for this theatre we've built, built up uh, and I'm coming to you to ask for your help. And I think you can start seeing some of that human element in these uh, examples from Chester Zoo. You start feeling that anger that um, parks have been able to open, for example, but despite the amount of outdoor space they've got, they've not been able to. Or another example here from Dulwich Picture Gallery, uh, written by their artistic director, again, who talking completely from her perspective, what she's seen, what she's felt during this time, and using that as a way to build rapport, build empathy with um, uh, with potential supporters. So don't be afraid to be, to be vulnerable about the position your organisation's in. Don't be afraid to share the fact that things are not okay because the people we're writing to expect that, the people that we're writing to understand that. They're going to be much more surprised if you're going out saying, everything's rosy, it's all going to be okay, which is how we used to have to talk uh, to the Arts Council, for example, or to the Heritage Lottery Funds. 
So uh, hopefully three points, points there, as I say, don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. Use this as a chance to, um, to build those relationships with supporters. But yeah, let's start being vulnerable about the supports we need and, and starting to be much more open and honest about how our supporters can play a part. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. So now we've had our four fantastic presentations. We're going to move into the Q&A section. And uh, Vicky's just going to introduce Ellie into the speaker box. Um, Ellie is the Grants Officer at Essex Community Foundation. We thought it'd be useful to have her expertise in this um, webinar so that people might have specific questions uh, for Essex Community Foundation, or it might be that she's got some useful insights about how these kind of things uh, that are going on nationally are having an impact uh, within Essex. So I'm going to crack on with some of the questions that have come up already. The first one's actually for Martha, um, and it's about um, how would you suggest um, approaching corporate companies for sponsorship? If you've got no link to them before, would you call, call them? How would you do that? Uh, that's a question from Gemma. Fern asked a similar question about whether you kind of already had these relationships or not, um, and whether they were new approaches or not. So how, what would your top tips for going about that be? Um, so, yeah, to answer the second question, I was talking about both existing relationships and new relationships. I don't really have a preference for account management or new business. I think they're both great. Um, in terms of cold calling, um, yeah, and, and when you don't have those contacts, it is, it is likely that you haven't done a contact mapping exercise because there's always kind of mutuals. You'll always find them if you do like a proper contact map if you're really serious about getting in touch with somebody because you know there are multiple ways into an organization it might be that you go in through someone that you already have a warm relationship with and kind of find the right person through that or you target that right person who's the right contact um both have um you know it's but both have their, their downsides um but yeah i would definitely use linkedin i think that's the best one um because you can work out whether you have any mutuals with that person um, and now is the time. If you're cold calling now, you'll get more of a response um, than if you were cold calling before the crisis. Um, people just, yeah, people are bored. They want to hear something new. Um, but definitely, if you make those approaches, um, you need to be leading with why them sponsoring will, will help them. What, what's, what, what's it going to bring to the organization? Is it going to give them better PR? Is it going to, you know, have opportunities for employee engagement um, and building staff morale? Um, so yeah, a few, a few things to think about, but yeah, um, I would suggest going through LinkedIn is my main thing. And also it's quite a good idea to follow CSR managers on Twitter, not just the organizations, because they will tell you what the priorities are for that organization through their Twitter pages. Um, yeah, that's my advice. That was really helpful. Thank you, Martha. I'm going to just have a look around to see if any of the speakers saying on kind of how to make introductions. Wave your hand if you do. If not, I'll ask the next question. All right. The next question, no, oh, you're ready, that's fine, um, is about, um, I think it's about trust and foundations mainly, but it might be that the others um, want to pitch in. So um, this is Valina asking, um, I want to keep my zero hours contract education freelancers and partnership artists and practitioners engaged um, with dignified but COVID aware work. Uh, many trusts and foundations have switched to emergency funding, which is good, um, but both 2020 and 2021 are looking bleak. Uh, which funders are still accepting normal ish applications? Um, I don't know if Will or Joe or Ellie want to go first on that one. Yeah, I mean, I gave a, a quick summary of some of the main ones. In my presentation that's still open for normal kind of funding so when that circulated round at the end you can see that but um some of them are yeah are in this emergency response mode but they will come out of that over the next few months um, and many are still open because they have both an emergency fund and they're kind of ongoing fund so i'd say even though the competition is going to be uh, higher right now and, and and perhaps the focus is on emergency uh, funders aren't getting the organizations have ongoing work and that they need to plan in advance. So I think that is actively being kind of considered and, and worked on. Thank you, Will. I just want to mention the uh, framework um, funding list. 
there are for those who are looking for covid specific funding um and some of the things that are on there aren't emergency specific but it's worth having a look at it you sign up it's free and you get access to a database with i don't know it's up to 600 700 but there's new ones going on all the time some are geographic uh some are um focused on different target groups um, and some are much more gen general. Thank you. David's just put the link to charityexcellence.co.uk in the box. Well worth having a look at the, the trust and foundations that are on there. Joe, did you want to add anything about trust and foundation? Um, yeah, just to sort of follow up what, about this bit about what I was talking about earlier, and, and Will also mentioned it, I think that a lot of trusts and foundations are also looking at charities and organisations that are thinking about how they can place their work online or do more digital working as I think we will be generally more reliant on um, the digital realm. Even, you know, if a vaccine's found, I don't think it will just all go back to the physical natured work. So I think if you are looking at working with your freelance educators or facilitators or artists and practitioners, thinking about projects that might have a digital aspect might make you more uh, fundable for certain trusts and foundations. Ellie, have you got anything um, that would be useful for people to hear about what you're doing at Essex Community Foundation? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I will turn on... I can't turn on my camera for some reason. Not sure why, but um, so you've just Maybe got a little Vicky logo at the moment. Are. Yeah, we can see you. We, we can hear you. We can't see you. Maybe Vicky can uh, help you with that. Um, Sorry, it's only showing me, giving me the option for a microphone at the moment, but anyway. Um, so at the foundation, we are running the Essex Response and Recovery Programme. So that has taken into account, like uh, has been mentioned, the, um, well, we're still in that response phase at the moment because of the money that we're running from the National Emergencies Trust um, and their national fundraising campaign. But we will be moving, I mean, that entire fund as that emergency or that emergency response work starts to develop will move into the recovery phase so there will be money out there to, and we've discussed this a lot about whether recovery is the right word or whether it should be more sustain and sort of that business as usual um kind of thing as well but as well so as well as this funding that we have available we also have some funding available from our 160 different funds that we manage as a foundation um, so there is and our new financial year, we'll sort of understand a bit more how we, much we will have to spend in that from August time as well. So there is definitely, I mean, we also run the Essex Funders Forum for lots of the um, major funders, or grants and trust funders in Essex too. And we are seeing real mix of them working on both sort of business as usual, sustaining organisations, keeping things running and really good point about adapting services as well, making sure that they are um, really relevant and can still be run and that you haven't just sort of said goodbye to a whole group of beneficiaries just because you can't see them face to face as well. And we realise like I think some things can't be adapted, but other things really can be. And it's made groups look outside of the box a little bit, which has been um, really good for us as well to see um, and to see how the voluntary sector is responding to that. Are there any places, um, uh, Ellie, that people should go and have a look at apart from, obviously they need to go and check out your website if they haven't done that already. Is there anywhere that you would advise people to, have, to check out? Um, I mean, the, the, we, so we have a list of other funders on our website as well, which are always helpful. And NCVO had, uh, have made quite a lot of their members resources free at the moment, which I know some people have found really helpful for fundraising as well as governance and um, sort of sustainability and um, how making positive changes within the organisation as well. Brilliant, thank you. It's really useful to have that really specific insight. We do have a kind of follow up question on Trust and Foundations from um, Leanne, which is um, as a CIC organisation, we've been turned down by three emergency funding streams, both national and local. What would you be, be your advice to looking for funding? We're only one full-time equivalent um, and be changing to a charity in the summer. I mean, actually, maybe that's a question for everybody, not just for Trust and Foundations, but maybe if we start kind of there and then bring in Martha and, and David Arthur. Will, Will or Joe, have you got any yeah. thoughts on uh, I mean, I'd say maybe um, 
I touched on it earlier, the, the 360 giving uh, resource where you can really um, examine uh, kind of grant making on a national level. So not only the COVID-19 grant tracker, but all of their trackers. And you can kind of search their data to see, to find other organizations similar to yours. So find CICs that are small, that are doing the type of work you're doing and see what funders have funded them. And then you can try approaching those funders or uh, even give them a call and ha have a chat to them. You can search on geographical area, organization type, theme of the work, and you can search on COVID-19. So it's a fantastic resource to use because then you can find organizations in a similar situation to you and what they've done. I mean, other people's annual accounts are also a fantastic way of finding out um, who's funding who. I certainly spend quite a lot of time digging around other charities and other organizations' accounts where you can get access to them. So for those trusts who aren't recording their data on 360, either going to look at their annual accounts or looking at the accounts of organizations similar to you and what they're doing. Joe, do you have any um, thoughts to add on that one? No, uh, Mark or David? Sorry, what CICs can be doing right now? Um, I think, uh, as Will said, looking at other people is a great idea. I'd also be looking at more along the business side as well. I mean, we know that CICs, there aren't as many trusts and foundations that will uh, support CICs um, as there are for charitable bodies but looking at things like the uh, local economic partnership for example or if you've got a business improvement district uh, in the area looking at grants and loans available through that can be a way of accessing funds that wouldn't be available to you if you were a charity uh, and I think as, as with a lot of things looking at those people closest to you already is a great place to start rather than trying to um, sort of forge new relationships if, if possible so if you've got existing supporters or existing funders people that have funded you in the past I'd be starting there um, as the first port, port of call. Thank you actually Ellie mentioned um, NCVO they actually have a searchable database of funders which is free for organizations that are under a searchable size called um, Fund Central I believe um, and you can search by different types of organisations, so you can put in that you're a CIC there. Um, anything else on that before? before I was just going to say, Lucy, I, I, don't, I don't quite know who asked the question, I can't see that, but have you asked the reason why you were rejected? I know as a foundation, we, our due diligence and our criteria around CICs is a, a bit stricter than it is on charities, because there isn't the commission and um, and that's supporting it. And is there a fundamental reason why? Is there, for example, is it that you've only got one director, so you're seen as a sole trader rather than as a uh, trusteeship, as a director board of CICs? Is it, um, is it about your accounts? Is it about your sort of aims? If those things are the reason why you haven't been funded, then is 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 there things that need to be changed before you can access further grant funding as well? Thank you. That's really, really helpful and useful. I mean, right now, I know a lot of funders aren't uh, spending time on being feedback, but if you are able to get feedback, whether you're a CIC or a charity, definitely doing that. We've got another question here uh, from Caroline. I'm interested in view, particularly David's, on a fundraising messaging at this time. Much of the arts fundraising messaging I'm seeing is focusing on the financial needs of the organisation and not focused on the impact of the loss of cultural experiences for beneficiaries and audiences. What do you think on that one? But there's not a specific question, it's just what are your views on that? How long have I got? <laughs> uh, I, I would argue this is an issue this, this has been an issue long before coronavirus uh, and in fact I was having this argument with someone on Twitter over the weekends. Um, so much arts and culture fundraising is based around the needs of the organisation rather than the needs you meet. 99% um, of arts fundraising starts with, did you know the generic arts organisation is a charity? Well, no, and I didn't care because that's not a case of support, that's not why I give. Um, there's a great saying that people give through organisations, not to them. Um, and I think a lot of supporters, whether that's individuals, corporates, trusts, 
people say, I'm really sorry, you're at um, financial year, your bottom line is, that's a you problem. I'm much more interested in what you're doing, what you're using that money for. The money is not the, the thing. Um, so I think absolutely looking at you know, what, what does that money mean in, in practice? What is the work you're doing? Who are the, the people, the communities that are being impacted by this? To tell me about the artwork that isn't happening, the exhibitions that aren't happening as a result of that money not being there. What, what does this really mean in terms of the work that you're there as a charity to deliver? Um, and, and as I say, I, I think that that's been an issue for, for a long time. We've got to get much better at uh, just expressing that and expressing it in an emotive way. Again, talking about the money appeals to a rational side of people's brains, but this isn't a rational thing we're asking people to do. Giving money away is not a rational act. Uh, and particularly when we're talking to individuals, we've got to convince their hearts before we can convince their heads that supporting our work is the right thing to do. So we've got to find a much more compelling story to tell. Thank you. Did anybody else want to come in on that? I mean, there is some absolutely fascinating work uh, going on around what David was talking about before the kind of heart mind decision making in um, fundraising. Do you check out decision? Oh, I'm going to say it right. Dec decision science. Um, I believe it's .co.uk. We'll, we'll some, if somebody could pop the you are asked what David knows what it is in there. Um, uh, there's some really interesting stuff. They've done a fantastic report on just little differences you can make in what you're doing to help increase your uh, fundraising income. A lot of it's based in um, kind of what, what other sectors have known for some time and have been doing for some time around behavioral economics that we in the arts are a little bit behind on, let's say. Um, Ellie, somebody specifically asked a question about connecting to the Essex Funders Forum. Is that something that's open to anybody or is it just for uh, fund, uh, trust and foundations who give out funding? Yeah, it's just for um, trust and foundations that give out funding, as you said, Lucy, at the moment. If you are one of those funders um, and you want to be part of it, then please do drop me, um, do drop me a line um, and we can definitely propose that you, to the panel that you join, um as well thank you ellie actually while we're on kind of giving top tips um i just wondered if the panel would share what what they're using to kind of keep up to date right now and i think they're changing so quickly um what blogs are you using any low-cost training what are you accessing um for me fundraising everywhere is a, a an absolute essential right now it's free for small organizations. I do the membership where I pay 20 euros a month and I can access all the content that's gone before as well as things as they come up. So they did a COVID specific um, conference day with, and that had two streams running simultaneously. They've got another COVID one this week. They've also got an individual giving one this week and they've got an arts one coming up and a grants one coming up. Um, so for me at the moment, they're putting out some really fantastic content. I know the others have also their favourites, so I'm not going to steal their thunder and, and, and do theirs. Um, if I start with, I'm going to do you so I can see you in my screen. David, do you want to give any top tips? This is going to be really awkward because I think Howard's in the, the audience, uh, so I'm relying on the other speakers to back me up when I say that I used this one last time as well. Uh, but UK fundraising, I think, is a great source for news and trends and, and articles and things that are going on, not just in the art sector, but across the wider charitable sector. So that's one of the ones I, I read religiously. Um, the Institute of Fundraising's Cultural Sector Network is another good one. So they're putting on lots of free and um, very reasonably priced uh, events over the coming weeks with the aim of trying to bring together arts and culture fundraisers from across the UK. Um, they're also on Twitter at um, IOF Culture. Uh, so those are two good ones. And linked to IOF Cultural Sector Network is IOF Raise, which again is a training uh, program, but particularly looking at arts and culture fundraisers. Uh, so we're checking those ones out. Unmute yourself before I start speaking. Thank you, David. Will, have you got any top tips of where people be keeping up to date with information? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the trust and foundation side of things, um, 
lots lots have individual blogs from their chief executives which are quite insightful mm. esme paul hamlin uh wolfson uh, i think all have have them on their websites and, and their social media uh, arts professional website is good um and ivar institute of voluntary action research they're doing a uh, kind of peer support uh, online sessions um, for fundraisers and other um, charity professionals as well. So check them out. Martha, any top tips? Um, I mean, everything that everyone's said so far uh, are all great resources. Um, I would also recommend Black Fundraisers UK um, if you are a Black fundraiser, um, because things are really difficult. There's an added an, ad, an added kind of um, emotional weight of you know what's going on globally, uh, global anti-blackness, um, and it's a, it's a great place to meet people who um, look like you in a very white-dominated um, industry um with co for corporate partnerships i mean it's very hard to um to kind of get all of that information because then businesses are not really part of the third sector um but yes i i use twitter to stay up to date um and linkedin um and just follow uh, people who are interested follow all of your prospects on um twitter and linkedin as well um so you can see whether there's a moment uh where they start talking about something that's vaguely related to what you're doing um, and seize on that Thank you, Martha. Joe, any to add that we've missed? Yes. Um, so it came up actually in our, our the session we did similar to this on Friday. Um, the Foundation for Social Improvement, the FSI, I have used them quite a bit in the past for training. They do free training and, and or very low cost. So if you're a small charity, you can get training that's uh, attainable. Um, also always possible which are hosting today their website um, has an amazing resource section now which is split into different sectors and so there's a bit on cultural sectors education sectors um, for individuals and freelancers so um, have a look at the always possible website and then in my own experience um, talking to my peers so speaking again to the partners and the organizations that my charity works with and asking what they're doing and how they're doing it um, and then also talking to your local council. Um, I know that several councils that I speak to for different projects are doing an amazing emergency response and again collating resources and signposting um, small organisations to different people in different places where they can get help. So uh, definitely go knocking on your council's door and ask them what they're up to and how they're helping support local businesses and organisations and charities. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to also pop the URL, um, as well as always possible, of Essex 2020 into the chat box for people. Um, there's a range of different things on there, including uh, funding and obviously how you get involved in Essex 2020. Um, Ellie, is there anything you would add to that wonderful list of resources? We'll never get any work done reading all this stuff, sending all the words now. No, I was going to say that. Um... Yeah, no, that list is very extensive, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, NCVO and just expanding on Joe's point as well as the local council, but also your um, local CBS as well. So your local council for voluntary services. In Essex, every district has one and part of their remit is funding for voluntary and community groups. Um, and so that can be anything from helping with bid writing to um, looking at your case for support as well on a very local level. Uh, as well as looking about what funds are available um, in your district too and linking up with the council and other funders uh, um, as well so they're always a good resource to tap into. Brilliant, thank you Ellie. We are getting quite close to the end of the session so uh, we've answered all the questions that I can see were on the Q&A and in the chat box. If anybody has a last minute question please do pop it in. I'm just going to ask Vicky to put the end poll up while we wait to just double check that there aren't any more questions. So for those who were here at the beginning, this is the poll to end. Uh, this is the first time we've seen the poll. Um, so please do answer the poll quickly just so we can get a measure of where people were and where they are. Um, please do um, let us know what else you want to learn. Um, you can get in touch with Always Possible with your thoughts on 
what uh, training needs there are, whether that is about fundraising, maybe you want to dive a bit deeper into some of what we've covered today, or maybe it's something else, maybe it's about making your work digital or how you plan to get back into your venue or back into your work. But let us know what your needs are so that the future webinars are really relevant to what people, um, what they want and what they need. Um, I really want to say thank you to all the panelists. It's been really um, fantastic to hear all your talks. They really are very insightful and also very positive, you know, kind of coming away from this feeling like there really is stuff that people could be getting on with right now um, and really good ways to connect with other people. So I'm just going to ask one last question, which is when we are feeling a bit um, like our confidence has been knocked or, you know, we're feeling a bit like have, we're having a really tough day, how would you suggest people kind of get their mojo back? I'm going to start with I'm going to go across the thing again and start with how you can encourage people to get their mojo back. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Was that me? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, apologies. Also, someone started hoovering in my house. So if you can hear that, I do apologize. Um, <laughs> great timing. Um, I would just say that... Um, I suppose from the trust and foundations point of view, like um, lots of trust foundations are very well resourced and, and, you know, even though competition is fierce at the moment, just have the confidence that um, lots of trust and foundations want to kind of step up and help in this situation. And they're putting lots more money forward than they normally would. Um, and lots of work is happening behind the scenes on new programs, new schemes, emergency responses. So the funding is there and it's being made available. So just, um, you know, that can help with the confidence level of a fundraiser, I think. Thank you, Will. Martha, how, how would you advise people to get their mojo back? Um, I would say that, um, yeah, just kind of re remembering, remembering why you do your job um, and remembering that um, this is an opportunity for you to be part of reshaping society um, after uh, COVID-19. It's quite exciting. Um, and also it's more important than ever that, you know, the right people are shaping society and that we're making it fairer um, and we're, you know, make, making it better. Um, so just remember kind of that, that overarching big goal, uh, <laughs> big picture, um, rather than kind of thinking about, you know, how difficult it is on a day-to-day -day basis. There, there's so much opportunity for us to come out of this better, um, so we should seize it. Thank you, Martha. Anything you would add, Joe or David? Go for it, Joe. Yeah, um, just to add that I think don't do it alone. Um, if you, I mean, it, it quite easy, can be quite easy to take everything on your own shoulders and feel like, you know, the weight of the world, you've got to raise money and you've got to save your organisation from what you're currently facing. So where possible, talk to others, reflect your ideas, get feedback, just to build your confidence that what you're thinking about doing is the right thing to do. And um, go out and look at what other organizations and groups and projects are doing as well and inspire yourself. There's some incredible response to changing dynamic um, and doing things differently because of what's happened. So go and look what other people are doing, get inspired and sort of excited by that and then sort of take that back to your own projects and your own organizations. Thank you, Joe. David, any final thoughts on getting your mojo back apart from start taking up running again, of course. <laughs> uh, that doesn't do it, that doesn't do it. <laughs> it's just an excuse to eat more um, sweets afterwards. No, I guess, um, so, so three things, uh, sort of following on from what Joe said of, of you're not doing this in isolation. Um, fundraisers are really good at, at sharing and, and sort of working together. So if you are feeling that, reach out to people. So I've said since the beginning of this, uh, my email is always open, my phone's always there. If people have things they want to talk through um, as a sort of open offer to try and help people through this. But there are groups as well. There's um, fundraising chat on Facebook, there are various LinkedIn groups where people can come together, share successes, share challenges, um, or, just, or find people that you know and like and arrange time to chat to them. 
uh, I think talking to your existing supporters can help with this as well, because it, there tends to feel like there's less pressure on that conversation. Um, there's not necessarily an ask. So you're, you're connecting with someone about something you both care passionately about. And I think that, again, linking back to Martha's point, can remind you why you're doing what you're, you're doing, what it's all about. Um, and then finally, the one that a number of other people have, have shared is just writing down one positive thing each day, something you've achieved or something you've looked at. That's a really positive thing. I want to remember that can help us stop focusing on the negative side and, and force us to think about the good things we, we've done and um, remind ourselves of that as well. Thank you, David. That's a really lovely place to end. And as David said, you know, you can connect with him. We're all on LinkedIn. Find us on uh, Twitter. We, um, when you get the presentation, you'll see all of our handles on there. Connect with Always Possible, but you know we're all open to answering questions or giving support or having a call. You know, like Martha said, you know I've had enough talking to my child some days. It'd be lovely to connect with some new people and have some new conversations. So keep making connections. I think that's the overriding message from today. So thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, everyone who's attended and stayed with us throughout the session. Hopefully we will see some of you again in the real flesh and in the real world soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. I've put an exit screen up, hold on.